Hey, Cedar Mill Youth, so excited that you're able to join us for tonight's online service. We're gonna be uh, having a time of worship, Nick's gonna be bringing a message, and then we're gonna be splitting off into groups through Zoom. Uh, before we do all of that, I'm gonna pray for us, and then Josh and the worship team are gonna lead us uh, through some worship. They'll take it away from there. So, would you join me? God, I wanna thank you for this opportunity uh, to have a worship gathering. Even though we're apart, I pray that this time would be meaningful as we gather separately, God, and yet together in one heart, one mind, one spirit. Would you just be lifted high? Would you uh, be given all of the glory tonight? And God, uh, as Nick preaches on the concept of Christ conquering death and fear, I pray that we'd be able to hang on to you, our steadfast hope and our anchor. Uh, we love you so much. It's in your name that we pray all of these things. Amen.
What's up, Cedar Mill Youth, Nick Mastered here. We are so excited that we get to meet online. It's not ideal, but we're gonna make the best out of the situation and we long to be together in person once more. But we are starting a new teaching series today and it's gonna to kind of lead up into Easter and we're calling it Undefeated. So if you're taking notes, write down Undefeated. We still believe that even online, note takers are still world changers. Let's get that going, get your notebooks, let's get focused. Let's allow God's word to take root in our lives more powerfully than ever in the season. You've heard this word before, undefeated, undefeated. Let's think of that for a second. It means that you have never been beaten. You have never lost. You're the current and constant champion in whatever battle or contest you're in. And maybe you've been undefeated in something. Maybe you hold like the highest score in your favorite video game if that's you, and, and your friends have no chance of taking it, like you're so far ahead of everybody, you're undefeated. Or maybe you're the first chair in, in your section of band, and you've been there for the last several years, and like nobody's taken that spot from you. Like you're shredding that trombone or whatever, and you're gonna keep that spot. And that makes you undefeated. Or maybe you've had an undefeated season in your sports team. Like no one was able to catch you, you were just so far ahead of everybody the whole time, you couldn't lose. Or maybe you haven't actually been undefeated at something, but you dream of it because you know that that feeling would be the best. Like you see other people celebrating when they're undefeated, like, yeah, and you hold on to hope that one day you're gonna be that underdog that all of a sudden steps into this plate, steps into this area of life where, where people just cannot defeat you. We're calling the next few weeks undefeated as a reminder and as an encouragement that Jesus has absolute authority and he has defeated all that we might be fearful of right now. In this time, we maybe feel, maybe feel um, pretty defeated or as if we're in the midst of a losing battle. But Jesus has a different perspective and he has something to say about all of this. And I don't know where you're at with Jesus or how your faith has been challenged in the last couple of weeks, but I pray that this series that we are walking through is a reminder and maybe just a fresh breath or a refreshment on how absolutely incredible it is to live a life anchored in Jesus. Like when our lives are found in him and built on him, get this, we are built on an undefeated foundation. We truly are. And one of the most seemingly defeating things we experience in life is fear. Fear. Have you ever been afraid of something or felt defeated because of your fear? Have you ever felt like fear has defeated you? Every so often, my wife Allison will hide around our house and she will jump out and scare me and I will react, right? I will react out of the fear like, Ugh! and that moment is a response to fear. And it is also the most humiliating and defeating moment where she has scared me and I've reacted and I usually just freeze and look at her like, oh man, I'm defeated. And it feels especially defeating when you react out of fear and the person's in your face going, It's defeating, right? Um, one of our cultural temperatures right now is that reaction of fear. We're scared. The, the fear... Let me remind you, it isn't a bad thing. Just like pain, it isn't a bad thing. It's actually an alarm. It's telling us that something is wrong. Fear is a warning light that we need to pay attention to. But we have to be careful that we don't allow fear to begin calling the shots in our lives. We can't allow fear to tell us to go right or left all the time. And I take comfort in the fact that God is well aware of our experience with fear. Do you know this is a question for you. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have an answer. Do you know what the most frequent command in the Bible is? Yeah, writer? Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, take a guess. What? Talk to your computer screen. Take a guess. What do you think the most frequent command in the Bible is? Let me just say, it's not love one another. It's not love God. It's not do unto others or something like that. The most frequent command in all of the scripture is some variation of this. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And this, this tells me two things. Man, this is so comforting. God knows what kind of world we're living in. He knows that we are going to need to hear this a lot because there is so much to be afraid of. 
I've actually heard that there are 365 times that it says this because we need one for each day. Don't be afraid. But also, too, this tells us something about the kind of life a Jesus follower gets to live. One that is surrounded by fear, of course, but isn't controlled by it. One that acknowledges fear, that it's real, that it can be big, but doesn't have to be, we don't have to be ruled by it. And, and you've probably figured out by now that you don't just grow out of fear. My, my hunch is that if you experience fear in seventh grade, you probably have some new fears in eighth grade. Like as you grow, fear actually just grows with you. And maybe you don't call it fear, maybe you call it stress or anxiety or being worried. No matter what you call it, um, you probably fear something. We, we all do, maybe for you, Luke mentioned some of these this last week, but fear of fitting in or getting the right GPA or getting the college of your choice or maybe the fear of um, your health or the health of somebody you love or the fear of your future or not amounting to anything or not having any real significance in life. Whatever your particular fear is, you don't need me to tell you that it's very real. You know that it's real, it's very real and the truth is, fear is on the rise right now, right? In fact, chances are good that fear is determining the direction of a lot of your decisions in some way right now. My guess is that fear is taking up a whole lot of your mental capacity. Like, I've been thinking of a lot of these things, a lot of these what ifs, right? And hear me out, I know that we need to be responsible in our, in our current circumstances with COVID-19. I know we're not gonna be like, we're not gonna be fearful and we're gonna do whatever we want. I think that's irresponsible. I'm not suggesting stupidity or irresponsibility, but I am asking that, that we sit with our fears, we face our fears for a little bit. Like if we were to boil it down, there is one fear that connects all other fears, and that is the fear of death. The fear of death. You might be thinking, wow, we were just, that took a dark turn. We were just talking about grades and GPA, and now all of a sudden we're talking about death. That was quite a leap. But this is, this is not just a physical death. It's, a, it's about the end of something important to us. For example, think, think, about the relation, think about it in relationship to some of the things that you have right now. Like, maybe we're afraid of really truly letting, letting people see our true selves. And, and the fear of that is because we think that if people knew the real us, their interest in being our friend would be over. Like we would experience a death of a relationship. Or maybe we're afraid of not getting into the college of our dreams. And because like if our application gets rejected, the dream that we once had, what does it do? It dies, it goes away. Or maybe we're afraid of um, the real us, like the secret stuff in our lives would be exposed. And because of that, if it were exposed, um, it would mean that other people's perfect image of us would begin to die. And let's get even more honest here. Right now, the number that everyone is focused on with this virus is the number of those who have died. Like, that's what makes this whole thing very scary. Like, that's a huge thing that instills fear into our lives. So whether it's a physical death or the death of something we hoped for or the, the fear of death, it, it, it all comes down to losing something that's important to us. We all want to keep things that mean a lot to us, right? We don't want those things to be in jeopardy. And when you think of it that way, it's easy to connect almost all of our fears back to the fear of death or the loss of something. And why do we do this? I think we do this because death seems final. Like, it, it almost seems like fear's knockout punch that gives it victory. Like, oh, you're afraid? Oh, now this thing is dead forever. Like, like you're afraid and then the thing that you were afraid of happening all of a sudden happens and then it's gone forever. So say our fears come true, say like, oh man, this friendship ended or this goal wasn't reached or this dream dies, and then we get to the end of our lives and we realize that death actually defeats us once and for all. That's flat out devastating and there's no hope in that. But that's, guys, that's exactly where Jesus comes in. That is where the reality of Easter begins to flood our lives, right in the middle of our fear, and more specifically, in the reality of death. What a timely moment to be resting in the truth and the reality of Easter. For those of you who are new to following Jesus, this is the time of year where we celebrate how Jesus came to earth. He died a criminal's death on a cross, and then three days later, when nobody else expected it, he rose from the dead. That is what makes Easter a big deal. It changed everything. 
death no longer has a hold on Jesus in those who follow him. I want to say that again. Death no longer has a hold on Jesus in those who follow him. There is peace and hope in that. A guy who really understood this in the scripture, his name was Paul. And before Paul became a Jesus follower, he spent years trying to scare Christians into leaving the faith, like using death as this ultimate threat. And he would threaten their lives, but, but then he met Jesus and it changed absolutely everything for him. This guy who, who used to threaten Christians' lives became one of the greatest missionaries of all time. So this guy, he, he was an insane missionary. He put his life on the line. He would do everything he had to to follow after Jesus and be like Jesus. He was like shipwrecked. He was thrown into prison, all cuffed up. He, he was threatened. He was beaten. He was bitten by a venomous snake. But he, he kept going because he was so passionate about people understanding the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection. He lived as if fear and death had already been dealt with. Get this. He lived from victory, not for victory. We, as Jesus followers, we get to live from victory, not for victory. The victory has already been won. And Paul's life was, was constantly in danger. He was always near to fear. He, it was close by. In fact, Paul was so radical that he was eventually killed for his faith. He took fear into account, of course, like, but fear didn't have the ultimate say in his life. Fear was real for him. I'm sure he was scared. But his belief in God was the thing that sustained and directed his life. Listen to how Paul speaks about death to a church that he wrote to in Corinth. This is what he says. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 55. Death is swallowed up in victory. He has victory over death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It's like Paul is taunting the idea of death by reminding the Corinthian church that on Easter, death lost to Jesus. Death actually lost. It didn't, it didn't move forward. Jesus was the undefeated one. When, when Jesus died and then rose again, he defeated death. And Paul is almost kind of like, like big-headed about this. He's like, come at me, bro. Like, death has nothing on me. Jesus dealt with this. He dealt with this fear, and I'm not going to be ruled by it. Yes, I see it. Yes, I'm scared, but I will not allow it to control me. And that means that because of the resurrection of Jesus, death can no longer defeat you and I. You guys get that? Because of the resurrection of Jesus, death no longer can defeat those who follow Jesus. Jesus himself is undefeated. The power that death has over our relationships or reputations or future hopes and dreams and even our physical bodies is gone thanks to what Jesus has come to do. Praise the Lord. We no longer have to fear any kind of death because Jesus destroyed death once and for all. After Jesus hung on a, on a cross and was placed in a tomb, in that moment, it seemed like humanity's greatest fear had come true. Like death was the ultimate thing to fear. To Jesus' closest followers, it seemed like his death was final. Like that was the end of the story. The dream was over. But when Jesus walked out of the tomb alive, it, it proved that even the power of death wasn't strong enough to overcome the power of Jesus. This is why Paul was able to live like he did, no longer fearing death. It's why he didn't seem to fear much of anything in his life after he encountered Jesus. He seemed to believe that the scariest things aren't the most powerful things. That's Paul's theology right there. That's Paul's belief and understanding of God. The scariest things aren't the most powerful things. The things we fear don't have the same power that Jesus does. He's the undefeated one. Paul trusted that the fears he faced were no match for the power of the resurrected Jesus. In other words, Jesus means fear isn't final. What does Jesus mean for our lives? He means that, that fear isn't the final thing for you and I. If Jesus can defeat death, then he can for sure defeat the things that we are afraid of. Fear, it'll try to convince you that it gets the final word, that at the end of the day, it will win. Like fear will try to convince you that you're not good enough, that you'll never find purpose, that your life isn't worth it. Fear will try to make you listen and obey it. And that's what power is all about, getting you to believe that, um, you know, that, it, that, it's, that you're not good enough. But, but here's, here's the truth. Fear is only powerful if it can convince you that it's final. 
Fear is only powerful if it can convince you that it is fine. Fear, fear will try to make you believe that nothing is stronger than what you're afraid of. But when Jesus defeated death itself, he showed us that nothing we fear is bigger than he is. Nothing we fear is stronger than him. He showed us that fear, no matter what we're afraid of, it doesn't get the final say. You may be thinking, you can't just tell me that because Jesus rose again, like I don't have to be afraid of anything. Like I'm still anxious. I, I still struggle with depression. I'm still terrified of some things that are ahead in life. Look, I understand that. Even if fear doesn't get the final word, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that's, that we, we are afraid of still. Like real things, big things. And it's not a guarantee that what you're afraid of won't happen. Like those things might happen. But it does mean that our actions are going to be directed by our faith in God rather than our fear. It means we're going to respond out of faith, not out of fear. I love what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 11. He says this, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, the one that raised Jesus from the dead, who defeated death, the undefeated one, that lives in you. Like, stop and think of that for a second. Paul is saying that the same power that defeated death 2,000 years ago when Jesus rose from the dead is actually inside of the people who believe in Jesus today. Maybe that is why Paul could live from this place of victory instead of for victory. Maybe that is why he, he seemed like he was free from so many of these fears that we typically face day in and day out. I was reading this article recently, and I want to share this, share this with you. Listen to what it says. He says, even if our emotions don't line up, even when it seems like everything in our lives are falling apart, our mouths can still join the chorus of God's adoration. We can say true things without feeling them. In other words, we can lead our hearts with our mouths. I have a challenge for you this week to lead your heart with your mouth. To lead your heart with your mouth. Because the loudest noise in our society right now is, is fear and panic. When that, that's difficult because we serve a God who is undefeated the undefeated Jesus. And, and because of that, we don't have to fear like the world fears. So I, I've written up this daily proclamation that we're gonna go ahead and put on social media platforms and whatnot for you to see. And I challenge you every single day this week, actually every day leading up to next Wednesday, I challenge you to wake up and this be the very first thing that comes out of your mouth. This be the first thing that you proclaim. This is a prayer. It's a proclamation. It's something that, that we live from. It's a, it's a victorious place that we're going to live from. And it goes like this. Jesus, you have victory over fear and death. Although fear is real, I choose to find hope and rest in you, the undefeated one. You are more powerful than the things that I will face today. When I fear scarcity, help me to live generously. Jesus, help me to respond to you in faith as I fix my eyes on you. I challenge you, do that every single morning as just this pro proclamation as we lead our hearts with our mouths. I've heard it said like this, fear says what if, and faith says even if. Fear says, what if? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this? And, and faith is this place where we say, even if this happens, I, I truly pray for a youth community and a church community that has a faith that says, even if, God, whatever may come, I am still going to choose to trust you. I want an even if faith. An even if faith. Even if the things I fear happen, Christ, you have the victory. I'm not going to live a life based on what might happen but based on what I already know will happen and has happened in Jesus. Let me pray over you, and then we're going to go ahead and discuss this a little bit more in our small groups through Zoom. If you haven't been on Zoom, it's at zoom.us, and at 745, we're going to go ahead and hop on those and be in our community groups. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this youth community. Thank you for the the blessing that technology can be and that it can be something that joins us and unites us. God, I pray for unity among our youth students in a time where um, distraction may be um, very attainable. I, I, I pray for um, God faith that we would live, that we would just be these people who live from this place of victory. I pray that you would give us this faith knowing that you have already conquered death. God, I pray that 
that we would be relieved, that there would just be this, this weight lifted off our shoulders today as we fix our eyes on you. God, shape our belief in you. God, we love you. We give our lives to you. Have your way in our conversations here in a few minutes. God, we dedicate ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. At this time, we're going to be moving into small groups through Zoom. So go ahead and type in your meeting ID, and then you'll be able to join a small group with your leaders and your, your peers. We're praying that this time fills your soul as you get to spend some a little bit of face-to-face -to -face with some people that you love. Tomorrow, we're going to be trying something brand new. We're going to be playing a game of Drawful, if you've ever heard of that, through Zoom. And you can find the meeting ID and the parent email, or you can hit us up on Instagram. We'll get you all set up. So we'll see you tomorrow at 4. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great night.